Welcome to Wyndham Abbey. We're going to start by taking a trip through time. It will involve the imagination of your eyes and ears, even your fingers, and if you're feeling brave, your nose as well. Let's go back 900 years to the 12th century and the first place of worship. You are now in a medieval Benedictine Abbey. Just stop there and listen for a moment. What can you hear? The monks may be at their daily office. If you listen hard, you will hear their voices amid the whispering of the wind around the stones outside. For many down through the, year, for many down through the years who have worshipped here, there is a sense of the presence of God. This is the purpose through all time, that this is a place for people to meet with their God, to pray, to praise, to hear the voice of a loving God. Take a moment to feel the stones with your hands. And if you want to imagine the smells, well, that might not be as pleasant for modern noses. But now you will really have to work your imagination. Not the whitewashed walls around you in medieval times, but statues and the walls covered in bright religious images. At a time when few people could read, this was their faith, pictorial, vivid, and inspired by God. There would have been a wooden carved screen depicting Christ on the cross, probably with Mary and John the Apostle. But now, as you sweep forward in time, you pass through the Reformation, the mass destruction of all religious imagery in two waves, the last by the Puritans. Sadly, 90% of all religious medieval art was destroyed in the two waves of the Reformation. Ah, but not all. Look up. There are angels watching over you. Many churches in Norfolk have angel roofs, and these, by and large, are some of the sole survivors of the Reformation. For those early worshippers, they were seen as a depiction of heaven on earth, and therefore re reflect the mission of Jesus to bring down the kingdom of heaven for us all. In the Bible, we find that real angels did indeed come down from heaven to meet with us mortals. So let's go and meet one. Here is one of the roof angels. As you see, he's somewhat wooden. Let's call him Gabriel. He's not at all frightening. He's about the same height of the people who would have lived at his time. But some of the angels recorded in the Bible were fearsome creatures. That is why the first thing they always said was, don't be afraid. Even today there are stories of people who have met such angels and been saved from disaster by them. And like some in the Bible, they didn't even realise that we were angels until they'd gone. Of course, everyone wants to hear how old and how big it is, what terrible things happened there. And in the case of Wyndham Abbey, its history is as bloody as many a cathedral. In 2016, it had over 37,000 visitors. With over 9 million visitors to cathedrals in 2015, excluding those attending services, cathedrals are still popular attractions. So why do people come? Some to pray, to meet with God, to find a sacred space, to seek help from chaplains, to buy souvenirs. People still see them as sacred places. Did you know that souvenirs bought from shops inside the cathedral are more popular than ones bought from shops that are situated outside cathedrals themselves? And some come for the guided tour. The guided tour seems to be a strange secret society when I started to ask questions. No one seems to know how many went on the guided tours. The guides themselves are a protected species. Some are historians, some are interested in art and architecture, and some even believe in God. But that isn't the requirement of the job. I started this presentation with an example of how I thought we could bring the presence of God into a guided tour using context and story. But clearly the guided tour cannot be a vehicle for direct evangelism. However, I did find a member of the clergy who had been on a tour of a mosque. At the end, the guide offered to explain Islam to anyone who wished to remain afterwards. 
In our cathedrals, this explanation seems to be offered by leaflets, apps and displays, and not ostensibly by many human interactions. According to David Bosch, mission is God's mission. But in order to fulfil that mission in a public forum, we ought to include some theology or context for that mission. At Norwich Cathedral, I was told the guides are there to give facts and nothing else. Further discussion on the topic was diverted onto other aspects of cathedral life. However, research into secular guide tours considers that tour guides have a pivotal role in, in visitor experience. Guides have roles as storyteller, mediator and interpreter. They should have empathy, understanding and facilitate an encounter with the subject of the tour. It finds in the areas of health and well-being, quote, some visitors may be actively seeking personal change and there are now operators who promote this as part of their tours. These are not simple roles to fulfil, but the world considers them important in a business context. In the closing chapter of her book, Apologetics Without Apology, Elaine Graham writes, my contention has been that if there is to be a new apologetics fit for the challenge of the post-secular, it will rest primarily not on arguments that are propositional and doctrinal, but on modes of discourse that are performative, sacramental and incarnational. If Missio Deo is about God in the world, then apologetics is a matter of speaking about God in the world to the world. But that is an activity that involves acting and speaking, participation and witness, an apologetics that is manifest in word and sacrament. This is a broad and embracing context for public theology, and the guided tour is part of the opportunity to further God's mission in the very place we ought to encounter his presence. For me, the real value of this reflective research has come from all the people I've spoken with from being on guided tours, from speaking to clergy and guides themselves. I conclude, yes, the guided tour is indeed part of God's mission, but after encountering a guide who told me she no longer is a churchgoer, I feel for the guides themselves. Are not their hopes, their dreams, their passions also part of God's mission? I personally think every guide, believer or not, should have training that enables them to include in the story of their building some public theology, and that would require great sensitivity and wisdom. I find it hard just to condemn the status quo, but the sacred spaces themselves have the presence of God within them, unnoticed or unnoticed. His mission is to reveal himself to guys and clergy, public and priest. The guided tour is indeed mission, however God is not limited to the faith of the individual guide but to the revelation of himself to all who seek him.